Hi guys, and welcome back to another IbraCorp video. And again, today we're with the awesome open source man himself, Brian, the open source advocate, and continuing our setup with setting up an IT business using all our open source products and services. I'll let Brian go ahead and introduce himself as well. Hey, it's your open source advocate. And yes, we are back and we kind of a basics setup start to finish so that was one of the requests you guys has is, is really start from scratch and go from from that point forward so we've both covered proxmox in the past but uh, we're going to go through the proxmox install today and uh, just kind of let you guys really start from the beginning with this series and see how everything functions and how everything works so this is a this is really starting from scratch if, if you don't have the hardware yet that would really be the starting point but so thanks for all the suggestions it was it was just amazing to see all those things. Uh, I know you I know you were kind of looking through them earlier. What you, I mean, you feel good about the business we picked here? Yeah, absolutely. There's been a lot of suggestions from the community, which we really appreciate. And obviously, I think for most of our community, people watching our videos, we come back to a bit of an IT space. So we're going to go ahead with that in mind. But just keep in mind that a lot of the tools that we're showing, it doesn't really matter. You can adapt it to whatever you need. We're just giving you an example of of using the, those tools in that space. But again, you can change them and, and chop it and change it any way you want. and Use it the way that suits the business you're going for. Uh, for example, if you're going to do remote support, it's not gonna matter what job it is, the tool itself will still help you. So really just apply it to whatever situation you're in and I think that'll be fine. Again, for the most part, everything we're gonna cover, you should be able to use in, in most businesses that, that would at least be working in the tech industry. Now, if you're going into something like finance or if you're going into something like medical, we may not cover everything that you're gonna want or everything that you're gonna need, but you can make requests on the side and we could always do those as side project videos uh, to, to kind of help you out as well. So we're always looking for other ideas, but for this one, I think we're gonna stick with uh, uh, basically tech consulting is, is gonna be kind of the generalized business that we're starting. And we're really going to start from the ground up. Um, I'm kind of excited about this because thinking through the process of what do we have to do in order to not only have the right hardware and software, but, you know, really kind of building out a business. So what other, what other support software is there that you need both internally, externally, um, everything that, that goes into it. So I'm, I'm really excited about this, ready to get this going. Absolutely. Well, with that said, we're going to get stuck into it. And the first episode today is going to be covering our base setup, which is going to be Proxmox for virtualization. It should be worth noting there's plenty of virtualization options out there. You can try all sorts of different things. Um, whatever you're comfortable with at the end of the day, go with that. Uh, we're comfortable with Proxmox. It's free and open source. And of course, it's also got enterprise grade uh, level redundancy and features and things like that if you wanted to go down that route further down the line now initially you're not going to need to worry about any of that stuff we're going to be looking at basic virtualization here but going with a good decision at the start means you'll be setting yourself up for success later and being able to have those features later without having to redo all your servers is going to be a big plus so we're going to start with proxmox ryan you ready to get started I'm ready. Let's get into it. All right, let's get into it. So we've got the ISO. We've got that directly from the Proxmox website. You guys can do the same. Now, depending how you want to go about it, you can get the ISO onto a USB drive. You can use something like Rufus to make it bootable. Alternative, you can use a tool like Ventoy as well, which lets you just put the ISOs on a USB and it makes it all bootable for you um, when you start up the new server that you've got ready to go. Now, we could talk about hardware really briefly. You're not going to need anything too crazy, depending on what you're going to be doing, of course. We're just, if we're just talking about web services and getting things online, you can look at the hardware in our videos for the TrueNAS series we covered. Um, alternatively, you can also look at some other options. You don't need too much, just enough storage to get some VMs going, possibly a terabyte, uh, a decent CPU, of course, and a fair bit of RAM. RAM is probably really important when it comes to virtualization because you're going to be spinning up a lot of servers and they can chew up resources if you don't have enough very quickly. Here we are on the installation screen for Proxmox. So let's go ahead and start with that. Next step, accept the agreement. If you accept it, I agree. And it's going to ask you for the disk you want to use to install Proxmox onto. And we've got our one disk here, so we're going to go ahead with that one. I just want to say that for Proxmox, it is much easier if you plan out the storage hardware that you want to have ahead of time and already have it installed in your system versus trying to add storage later. Absolutely. If you're just going to test it out to see if you like it, definitely go and do that. But 
be ready to reinstall and then have all of the storage hardware you want in place because it does, Proxmox just picks up on that during the installation process. But if you try to add storage afterwards, you have to kind of go what we'll call the, the mm. Linux nerd route and you have to get in and you have to actually have to partition the drives through the terminal and then mount the drives to the terminal and set it things up in your FS tab and, and so on and so forth to really get those things to show up in the Proxmox interface so that you can get those things. So just, just a suggestion to make sure you've got your storage ready before you really kind of go through this the way we are right now. Um, we're doing this just so you can see the process of getting everything installed and set up. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. That's a really good point, Brian. And it can be really annoying, especially if you're not that experienced with it later down the track. So just have it ready to go right from the start. You have other options there, depending on the file system you might want to use. Now that might be getting a little too far into it, but you've got XFS, EXT4, and a whole bunch of other ones as well. If you're just starting off and you want to get into it, you can leave it as EXT4 or pick XFS. That would be my recommendations. Um, I think at any, any, I'd say any of them that support snapshots is probably your best bet because that lets you do snapshots uh, down the road to your other disks. Now, setting those disks up to be, you know, you can set up all your different disks to be uh, partitioned and formatted in different different ways too so depending on how many different drives you have for your storage it may not matter what you do with the boot drive but yeah um, exe4 or xfs for the boot drive should be fine now the next one i don't think we need to tell you guys but just pick all the details that match your setup where you are in the world how you want things to work you've got your keyboard for example and your region then it'll ask you to create a password and put in your email address once you've done that go ahead and click next yeah, so on this one, if you're just going to run this as a local as a local server, I wouldn't worry too much about the FQDN having to be anything special, but you just want to give this basically a name. So so for me, I gave my system just a name. It doesn't have a full FQDN on my on my network other than what my network assigns it. So uh, in my case, it's aria.mcglocal. I don't use local just because that's kind of a Microsoft reserved type naming structure. But yeah, yeah you could you could use anything you want. Definitely, so you know, feel free to give that a a name that's memorable, something you can find on your network. And then on the IP address, put in what you want to assign it. If you if you have something specific, otherwise you can let DHCP handle it. And then that will get set and you can actually set this to be static afterwards. And then the same thing with your gateway information. That's just your, your router, your gateway to the internet. You want to make sure that that's set correctly. It should auto detect it. If it, if it doesn't, you can go ahead and set that. And then DNS, uh, if you want to use different DNS servers, you can change usually the gateway is what you're going to want to use just correct yeah so just pick whatever suits you guys and your setup at home or your business wherever you're setting this up the ip address mind you this did get pulled through from dhcp so if you're happy with what it already picked up you can just go ahead with that i'm just going to go ahead with that and um, you get your summary here basically of everything we've just put in if you're happy with all that now it's time to get the installation started so we'll pretty much just wait for that and we'll come back to you guys once it's finished all right, guys, and the installation is now finished. As you can see, it's basically rebooted itself and it started up on the terminal screen. And now at this point, you can pretty much walk away from the machine, go onto whatever your workstation is, head to the IP address that you see here, and it'll take you to the interface. Uh, if you don't see this screen, obviously you might need to do some troubleshooting, but this should be hopefully where you're at and you can continue with us to the next step. All right, guys, so we've put in the IP address and the port, and it's taken us to our interface. Now, it's going to ask you to sign in. Obviously, this is the sign in, the password that we used when we went through the installation wizard, and the username is root. Now, something you guys might notice is my theme will look a lot different to yours. I did run a theme. It's called the Discord Dark Theme for Proxmox. We'll drop a link down in the description for you guys if you're interested. You'll also notice that this is my actual live system, so there is a whole bunch of stuff in here, but you can ignore all that. You basically have nothing in here, and that's okay. We're just going to be starting fresh anyway, so just ignore all these virtual machines and containers. We'll be showing you how to set all that up in due time. So where do you think we should start, Brian? I think actually starting there at the top level that you've got it and kind of looking over at, the, at that next menu to the right, just kind of going through those things there to kind of show everybody what's, what's there, because really, you know, Proxmox can be clustered with multiple servers if you want to do that. You can also just control multiple servers from a single server interface by, by hooking them together. So that kind of that top level is really like my cluster and then the next one down is really your server and so on. So so kind of looking at that that first setting where you've got like your, your storage and your backups and stuff like that at that level, I think is probably a, a good thing to go through just briefly. Yeah, no worries. So let's look at the file flow here. The first thing you'll notice is we have data center 
and then we have PVE. Now PVE is the name of this server that we've set up, which is also known as a node. So as Brian was saying, we can have several nodes. We could have uh, two other servers in the same business or house or even remote, and you can configure them to be uh, more redundant with each other. So starting at the data center level up here, this essentially is our data center. Let's think of this house or business as our data center. And we have maybe one server, we call that PVE. Maybe we set up another server called PVE2. There would be two nodes under this data center. So the settings at the top are probably gonna be one of the most important for you to go through at the start. And if we just scroll through, we can put notes in. Here's our clustering. This is a very detailed subject, which we're not gonna be going through just at the moment. So don't worry about that too much, but here's all the options for clustering when you get to it. So let's go to options. And now here's some of the options that you do probably wanna have a look over and just make sure they, they're, they're correct. We've got our keyboard layout. We picked most of this in our setup anyway, but this is what mine looks like. And I pretty much haven't touched any of this. So you shouldn't really need to, unless you have a need to. The next part is a storage. Now this is an important one. This allows you to add storage from any sort of resource. If you have, for example, an SMB share, we can set that up here. This is something we covered in our TrueNAS series as well. So you can yep. attach SMB shares, you can attach local storage. Now these should already be here for you, local and local LVM. That's basically the local storage of Proxmox. Uh, and then I have created different shares in my TrueNAS server, which is handling all storage. So that's all you're seeing there. You can ignore those, you don't need to have them. And here's our Proxmox backup server, and then there's TrueNAS. So basically in your scenario, you should have only these two visible, and that's all right, unless you wanna add any more. If you do have another storage service, maybe you have a cloud server that you have storage on or anything like that, just go ahead and add it. And you can add all the different types of storage as well. So if you had SMB, you would be able to add it that way. I'm in the same screen. You can also configure backups, which we'll get to shortly. So let's go to backups now. And here's our backup option. One of the best parts about Proxmox, in my opinion, is the backups and the snapshots. It's very easy to set up and manage, which is really, really important, especially if we're talking about setting up business infrastructure. Did you have anything you want to talk about backups, Brian? Yeah, I mean, just, just quickly on backups and snapshots. So, so snapshots are a, an amazing piece of Proxmox and they're really great. The thing you have to remember is that snapshots are, are kind of like a picture in time. Um, and if anything happens to the system, your snapshots are super useful to bring things back to the way they were at a point in time. So think of it kind of like Windows Restore Point, that, that kind of thing. Whereas a backup is like, I'm taking a full image of this thing and I, I want to store it not only here, but I want to store it on other media and in other locations, if at all possible. So, so kind of keep that in mind when you, when you think backups versus snapshots. You know, snapshots are great for like, I just need to jump back to a point in time where something wasn't messed up because I was tinkering or, or something like that. And backups are really like, hey, I've got the whole system here and I do this on a regular basis and I have it in multiple places just in case anything catastrophic happens. Um, but yeah, the, the backup capabilities here with Proxmox are, are awesome. And again, I think it'd be worth, um, maybe, maybe we'll do this in another video, but setting up like TrueNAS or Rockstore or OMV6 or something like that. And then setting up like an NFS share and, and really just, uh, you know, showing them how to get the backup set up to those remote systems. So that again, if you're setting up a business, these, these should be things that you plan for, um, the hardware that it's, that it's going to take to do it. If you don't have it just laying around what the cost would be. And then backup hardware is basically double that storage cost, if not triple it, to, to make sure you've got plenty of room for more than one backup, um, you know, things like that. So yeah, definitely, definitely something that's really important in the system is something that I'm sure we'll be covering a lot more on. Definitely, yeah, it's really good, really good points you've made there. I mean, if we're gonna be going through all the effort to set all this up, we really need to be thinking about our data retention, backups, how do we restore business as quickly and as efficiently as possible if things go haywire, um, because that could be essentially money out of your pocket if it does become a successful business. So stuff that will definitely go over. I think we'll come back to that subject as well. Now, just briefly going over the remaining settings, there shouldn't be too much we need to fill around with, but we've got replication here, something we'll cover again when we have at least two nodes. Uh, then we have permissions if you want to create users. Um, we can also set up two-factor authentication, which is great. Groups and pools. We also have roles. So here's all the different roles that are built in. The next thing you have down here is your ACME certificates. So we can get SSL certificates generated for us. 
We then have a firewall. Now the firewall is pretty interesting in Proxmox. It actually works on multiple layers. So we have a firewall on the data center layer. We then have a firewall on the node layer. And then you have the firewall on every single virtual machine or Linux container underneath that. If you guys do look into the firewall, it's really important that you look at it from the top level down and just be careful not to enable it until you've put in exceptions for things you wanna be able to access. So for example, this is obviously the top player we're looking at data center. Go to security group. This is the rule that says, I want you to accept any requests on port 8006. So when we enable this, we wanna be able to reach Proxmox. Otherwise the firewall will actually prevent us from being able to access it as well. And we can get into more detail about layering and all that. But I mean, just for basic set up a security group, you can see we've opened up certain ports and things like that. And then you enable the firewall at the end. Uh, the next level is the node. And as you can see, most of the options are pretty similar. I think you guys can work out most of them uh, on your own. But the one thing I will recommend that you definitely change right after an installation is your updates and repositories. So if we go to our repositories over here, you'll see that uh, the no subscription repository is currently unchecked and I have the enterprise one checked. But in your case, you'll have it ticked and it will say that you don't have a subscription active. So what you wanna do is uncheck that or sorry, select it, disable, go ahead, highlight the free no subscription option and enable that. Once you've gone ahead and done that, yep. you can then go to the update section and click on refresh. And, and I would say even if, if this is gonna be a production server, I would I would caution against turning on the, the, the no subscription updates, um, you know, the, the, the more frequent updates, just because you don't want something to break your server. Um, you do get updates when you're on the enterprise, when you have the enterprise ticked, but you're, you're not, you don't have a subscription, but it's security updates. It's things where they know like, Hey, we need to push this out because it's a security uh, fix for what right. you have. Yep. So they're not going to be super frequent. Um, but, but you do get them. And then of course, when there's major release updates, they'll tell you, Hey, there's a major release update. I would say on major releases, unless you're super comfortable with doing it, wait for people um, like us or, or other YouTube creators who, who come out with like, here's your step-by-step -step guide on how to do this because they've probably set up a Proxmox server on an old version and then run through that multiple times to make sure they understand the steps. And, and if you want to watch that, great. If you want to go check out the documentation, uh, same, same concept, I'd say, you know, be careful with your updates just because again, if it's a production server, you don't want to have that thing go bad uh, in the middle of anything like that. So, so yeah, just, just a, a thought there on those, on those kind of, different repositories i've i've been using the uh the, the repository up above that on the uh, above the enterprise area that no subscription repository and i've had no issue at all so yeah. far um, yeah. and i've been using it for about a year but again it, it's always a risk just you know just kind of know that so it's not a production system i use it on it's my test one the other one i don't have that turned on so yeah absolutely yeah definitely wanted to clear that up with you guys it's a really important one to sort of demystify because it can be a little confusing at first then uh, under the node settings, you have the firewall, like I said, we won't go through that again, but you can basically just add whatever you've added on the data center level. And then you have your disks. Now, if you've set everything up already from the start, you shouldn't need to do anything in here just yet. You can just leave it as is. If you wanted to, and you know what you're doing, go ahead. But otherwise I would suggest just leaving that for the moment. Next part is the Ceph. Again, we'll come back to that in future replication and subscription. So that is setting up the node and the data center in Proxmox. Now that basically gives us a canvas for us to create our virtual machines or Linux containers. What do you reckon, Brian? Where should we go next? I mean, why don't we, why don't we do a Ubuntu VM? I mean, that's, that's kind of where I'm going to start and, and I'm going to create a Ubuntu VM that's going to be just set up for, for doing Docker hosting. Um, that way I can, you know, I'll have a place where I can go set up anything, any applications that we're going to want to run, I'll be able to set them up in Docker, basically, um, if, if they're Dockerable, at least. So we could do it as a VM or we could do it as an LXC container. It's kind of up to you. Look, uh, we've covered both, and I think both options for you guys would be really interesting. So why don't we quickly just show you how to do both, um, and we'll pick one that we'll stay with for our installation. So first things first, let's go with an LXC container, and I'll show you what that is. Now, basically, without having to go into too much detail, a virtual machine is, like the name suggests, a whole virtual machine running on the hypervisor, which is Proxmox. The LXC container is actually using all the resources directly off the server, but then virtualizing the operating system. If my understanding is correct, Brian, and correct me if I'm wrong on that. That is correct. So oh, instead of right. yeah, instead of passing through virtualized hardware and resources to a virtual machine, 
it actually shares everything with the kernel and the host which is obviously a lot faster now if you guys ever see this we'll cover this in an upcoming video as well but the lxc container you can basically restart it in less than 10 seconds it's really phenomenal so let's say we wanted to start up a lxc container first you'll see we're in our node right click and go to create ct it's also in the top here as well if you want to do it that way but let's click on create ct we give it an id let's say 600 the host name we'll just call that test lxc just because i have such a creative mind the id will say 650 that's a valid number and create a password also confirm that password as well can yeah, also use it definitely it, make this a strong password yeah um, you know for for us when we're doing these for you guys we, we make them whatever we make them but make it a strong password because this is going to be your root level password for your for your container absolutely yeah please please make it secure you can also use ssh public keys if you want to use those as well another important aspect of the containers is there is a lot of uh how do i put this permission layers and, and restrictions in place to try and protect your system because it's going to be sharing the kernel and it's going to be sharing resources directly from the host there are some protections in place now if you want to bypass those it's pretty easy if you don't bypass them it might be tricky later when you're trying to do a couple of things and it might you know you might have to change some settings later for the purpose of this video i'm going to show you guys a privileged container so it has full access to whatever it needs to do but you don't have to do it that way but let's just go ahead and i'll show you what that means so currently the option unprivileged container is checked very confusing wording basically it's asking is it an unprivileged container and we're saying yes i'm going to uncheck that so we're saying we want it to be a privileged container we'll then go next and it's going to ask you for your storage and for a template now you won't have any templates in there at first so i think if we just go to local and we go to ct templates you can choose to upload or download one from a URL, or you can pick from the templates. Thankfully, that's already built into Proxmox. So if we click on templates here, you see a whole bunch of different templates that you can spin up in seconds. Uh, you've got Turnkey Open LDAP, for example. You've got Turnkey Invoice Ninja. I mean, it's pretty, pretty cool. Yep. Um, and like I said, this is running directly with the host. So it's gonna be fast. It's gonna be powerful. But let's go up to the top. We've got Ubuntu here. Pick the one that suits you. I would recommend uh, 20.04. It's a stable release and it's probably gonna give you the most compatibility. So I would go with that and click on download. So now we're back with the template. If I select it from the list, you guys should have that now as well. We click on next. And it's gonna ask for your storage. Now here's something that's really cool. You don't need much. I mean, if you're not planning to do too much at first, you're just running some Docker containers, which is what we're gonna show you. You probably don't need that much storage. I would recommend enough for your Docker image and maybe some app data, depending on how much um, you may be using. If you're already using Docker somewhere, a good way to go about it is to check how much, how much space is actually already being used by your Docker image and by your containers. And that way that'll give you a rough idea on how much you might need. But let's say in our case, we're gonna go with eight just for the purpose of this video, but that's gonna be completely up to you. Go ahead and click next. Select our cores, we can give it four cores. Memory, don't need much, but I'll give it 4096. And then we have the ability to set our IP address. So let's say we want to set IP 1.34. And on this one. step, it does have the option for DHCP up there, but it's not checked by default. So I highly recommend setting a static address. Because Correct. when you're doing things where it's servers and you want to be able to access them, you don't want suddenly that your DHCP gets wiped and it gets a new address. And now you're trying to reach things that you have proxied and they're not going to the right place. So... So definitely set a set a static address. If if you if you have the power and the capability to do that, you should do that. Definitely, definitely. Um, a lot of people recommend also you can do it on the router level. I honestly like doing it on the machine level. I just know that way it's always got its own address. Depends how you want to work it. But uh, don't forget to put the CIDR on the end here, which is slash twenty four for this subnet. Mm -hmm. We're going with 134 as our IP address. You don't have to check anything else. I did untick the firewall. I don't even have the firewall enabled at the moment, um, but just something to be wary of. If you're not ready for it to be on yet, you can uncheck that. If you're happy with the rest of it, now our default bridge is VMBR0. If you did create any other sort of bridge by now, or for whatever reason, make sure you pick the right one. We'll go to next and we can leave all this the same to use the host settings. If you have a DNS you want to put in, go ahead and do that. Otherwise, you can just leave it and it will use the one from the host. Go ahead and click next. And you can start it after you create it if you like. I'll just show you some other settings before we do. Click finish. 
If you didn't know as well, any of these windows that open up in Proxmox, you can just close those and it will still be running. You will notice that here in the activity log. You can open it back up again. So don't worry if you if you close it, it is actually still running. Over here is our container, test LXC. We'll just go to options real quick. And there is a couple options here you might want to know about. The first thing, and this applies, some of them do apply to virtual machines as well. Do we want it to start on boot? We can say yes. Yep. Uh, what order That's do one we of the want? Most important ones for sure. Absolutely, yeah. You'll be caught out with that without that one. Uh, the next one is a startup shutdown order. You can set up a shutdown order. I want it to start up first, for example. The startup delay, that basically means after it starts, how long do you want it to wait before it executes the next one in the order? So I can say 30 seconds. Yeah, and you want to talk about confusing. The first time I saw that option, I, I just, I was thinking, how long should this one wait before it starts? And yeah, I had to go look at their documentation. I was like, oh, okay, it's completely back from what I thought. It, yeah, I yeah, don't know. Some it, of the terminology is uh, totally, a bit, yeah. I really need someone that in there, I think, to work on some of the terminology. But anyway, uh, the other two options I wanted to show you is the unprivileged container. So this is what we set earlier, and we've already said no. So it won't let us change that right here. But we can actually select other features. If we click on edit, we can allow nesting. We can allow NFS, SMB, and Fuse. Now, by default, none of those are enabled, so they won't work. Um, depending on your purpose, if you wanted to map an SMB share like we did with our TrueNAS setup or anything like that, then you want to make sure that's enabled. Also, NFS and nesting. I'm going to enable those options, and we're pretty much ready to start it up. If we just go ahead and start it, and we open the console, how's that? It's already up and it's running. Up. Was that before you could open the console? That's pretty impressive. It's amazing. So if I just log into that real quick, you can see from this point on, it feels like any other Ubuntu server. There's nothing that would really throw you off or anything like that. Um, if we weren't running a privileged container, you might notice some differences and you might have some particular issues. There are some settings as well that are done via the command line if you needed to change them. So, you know, things like um, passing through certain hardware. But in our case, we don't need to really need to worry about that. That's more if we're running like a Plex server or something. But so for now, that's fine. If I was to reboot it and I just open up the console again, it's already back up. So you guys can see the benefit yep. of having a container. It's just amazing. It's so fast and lightweight as well. We go to the summary. It's basically using nothing to, to start up. 30 megabytes of RAM. Now, Brian, do you want to walk us through a virtual machine real quick? 30 megabytes of RAM. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh that's insane yeah isn't it oh my gosh so yeah if, if you're running proxmox on a on a on a system that doesn't have a lot of resources to start with you know eight gigabytes 16 gigabytes of ram lxc containers are going to be your best friend um from a from a vm standpoint if, if you can figure out how to do it in lxc that's going to be your your best bet um because like 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 we started with vms a full ubuntu they're going to take at least a gig, two gigs of RAM to, to just sit there running and, and sit idle. And and the other thing is a full VM, when you give it resources, it takes those resources right then. So if you say this VM, this Ubuntu VM, a full VM, I'm going to give it eight gigs. It's going to take those eight gigs and it's going to like set those aside. Like nothing else can use those eight gigs while that VM is running. Yeah. Even if it's not using them, it, it's reserved. Whereas the LXC container just says, this is all I need to be running right now. So that's all I'm going to take. And it can go up to four gigs if it needs it. So it, it's a nice differentiator there that, that really can make a difference. Now, that said, LXC is not perfect for everything. So you, you may have to kind of work with it to see what you can get it to do in certain in certain situations. Like uh, like like we've said, the, the options that you select will depend on what kind of limitations you might hit. But you can do a lot. There is a lot you can do with these things. So so definitely, um, if you have a low resource system, this is a, a good way to go. It's pretty phenomenal. I think it's, it, honestly, it's probably the way to go forward for us as well. Um, I've been using it a lot. As you can see, I have three running right now and slowly moving away from that VM infrastructure. But we'll get there. But speaking of it, of uh, VMs, let's get into VMs real quick. I'll show you how to start up a virtual machine. And that way you guys have both options and you can basically be on whatever level you want for the next stage in our series um, when we start working with Docker and containers. So let's quickly show you a virtual machine, similar to our LXC container up the top, or you can right click the node and create a VM. First, we wanna make sure we have an ISO. So why don't we go to our, I have an ISO storage here. 
This is where all my ISOs are. Yours might be on your local by default. So it doesn't matter where it is, put it wherever you need. Now, the coolest thing I found about Proxmox is we can download an ISO directly from the source if we have the URL. That's one of my favorite things to do. So if I bring over Ubuntu server here, we've just gone to the Ubuntu website. You can see we get, lets us download it. If we click on download, it's going to pop up and ask us to download it directly to our computer. But if we actually just right click this, copy the link, and we come back to Proxmox, we'll click on download from URL, paste that URL in there, obviously making sure the URL actually leads us to the ISO. We query it, it will pull it through, check whatever you want and click on download. Yeah, they added this in this most recent major version, actually. Before this, you had to download it to your local machine and then upload it through the web UI to, to Proxmox. So this was definitely one of the best ads. I think this was one of the ones that most people were excited about because they're like, finally, I don't have to do this two-step process to get these ISOs over here. So yeah, it's, it's been great. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, now, I've already got it on here, so I just stopped it. But you guys just would just let it finish. Yeah. And there you go. You would have the ISO there ready to go. Just cuts down having to put it on your server and then put it on that server and just have that extra bit of wait time let the server do all the work and you can yep. basically leave it it's headless you know so we can just leave it to download the iso if you have a slow internet connection which is really cool so we've got the iso let's click on create vm real quick we'll say 651 is our vm id remember these need to be unique and another little tip is if you've removed the vm or the container Probably best not to reuse the same VM ID. I really wish Proxmox would actually indicate to you that you've used this before. Because what could happen is, at least in my case, Brian, was I reused the VM ID. And then I started to notice some really weird stuff like backups from the old machine were starting to show up. Uh, certain jobs from the old machine were starting to show up. It was kind of... It, it just, really? Yeah, it kind of drops into the same spot. At least I found out. Maybe I'm doing something wrong here. So, I don't know. I just like to pick a new uh, yeah, ID every time if it's a new machine. I haven't seen that, but it's interesting to know that you've seen that because I, I, I definitely have reused IDs in the past. And, and if that's a bad thing, I can stop because there's a lot of numbers you can use for an ID. So, I mean, I don't know how yeah. to reusing the same Look, numbers over and over. Could just yeah. be a local thing. I don't know. But in my scenario, I just find it easier to just go with a brand new -y. Again, you've got your startup and shutdown order. This time it's actually in the wizard for VM. So, you can set all that if you like. We'll go to next, it's going to ask for our ISO and just pick the storage location and the image. So after you've picked the ISO, go ahead to system. You can pick any graphics cards or anything like that. I wouldn't recommend enabling the QMU agent until you actually install the agent on the machine. Otherwise it will stop a lot of the functions that Proxmox tries to issue commands and won't work. So just leave that off until you've actually done that. And we'll cross that bridge when we get there. Something that a few people have asked me, I'll just touch on it real quick. If you're running Windows 11, one of the most important features that you can enable is the TPM module, which is here. In our case, obviously, we're not using Windows, so we're not going to enable that, but that's something that's required by Windows 11. So I just saw some people comment saying they were stuck um, before, so just an important one. So let's click Next. Here's where you create your disk. Now, my scenario, again, I don't really want to create a big disk, especially on local. Um, I can create it on the TrueNAS share, but we're just going to leave this so you guys can compare it to your setup. Um, do we want included in a backup job? A bunch of other stuff. That's because I've got advanced checked. Just something to note. Uh, but I'll leave it on 8 gig and we'll click next. We'll give it four cores. Click next. And again, 4096 RAM. I'll uncheck ballooning device, but you have that option if you want to. Do you want to explain ballooning device real quick, Brian? Basically, you can have kind of a min memory set, and, and I guess you'd think of it as like, this is what you can use up to, but if it suddenly becomes where the system needs it, it can balloon up to a larger size setting, and then kind of, so it expands up as it needs it, and then comes right back down, and, and really, generally just, you know, doing normal tasks, it's going gonna, it's gonna to kind of see that other, that first setting as your as your max, but then you can balloon if you need to for... I guess, intensive tasks that are kind of boom. That, that's the way that I understand it. At yeah. least. Let it ramp up if it you needs know, it's it. It's really not something where it runs there all the time. It, it, what it is, is it says, I'm going to allocate this 4096, but you've told me if I need it, I can go grab basically 12 gigs or whatever you want to set that at. Right. Yeah. Um, but generally I'm just, I'm just, I'm, I'm seriously going to set aside this 4096. You're not going to have access to it. 
Yeah. And then if I need it, I'll go grab some more. So that's basically what it is. Cool feature if you guys think you might need that. Like uh, Brian was saying, especially with Windows, if you've got the compatibility, it's pretty handy to have. We'll click next and here's our network section. Now, something we didn't touch on yet, Brian, was networking. And I think, guys, we're going with the assumption yep. you have a very basic network at the moment. We're not looking at firewalls or anything in this particular setup. However, in the future videos for this series, we will cover some advanced networking because we might want to get some PF sense going. We might want to have some more advanced firewalls. We want to have some more uh, virtualized networks. How do we go about doing that? So just for this purpose of today's video specifically, we're just assuming it's just the basics at the moment. We're not looking even at port forwarding because that again is another subject. We'll bundle in together, I think with a networking topic, maybe next week. We're trying to get the basics of get your Proxmox set up and then we can tackle some of the more advanced networking stuff afterwards. It's all in the UI. That's right. Um, so there's yeah. nothing really special that we have. We'll go ahead and click next and check all the settings. If you're happy with them, you can pretty much start it off and fire it away. So I'm going to start that. And while it's starting, I'll just quickly run you through some of the options that a VM would give you as opposed to LXC. So if we go to hardware, you can see all the different hardware options we've already selected just then. So if you needed to make a change, if you wanted to add another disk, you can add another disk. If you wanted to add a USB device or pass through another device like a graphics card or even your built-in Intel, you can do that. So if we go to device, here's all the devices currently plugged into my server. You can see we've got our um, network controllers so we can, for example, pass through network controllers to something like a PFSense box. We then have our Intel built-in GPU. If you're running a Plex server, that might be something you might want to pass through, for example. Just a couple of things like that. It's all done in the UI, whereas with the LXC container, it's done a little bit differently. So I wanted to show you guys that as well. If you go to options, then you have things like your Cumu guest agent. So when we install the agent later, you can come back and enable that. If you have a different boot order, you can change that as well. Just a quick tip for you, if you add or remove a disk. If you add a disk and you want that disk to then be your boot drive, make sure you come into the boot order, edit it, and enable that option. By default, it's disabled. Just if you're wondering why your disk's not booting, I've done that many times, so. The, the, the other option you had there was the same one as on the uh, LXC containers, which is, do you want this to start at boot? <laughs> yes, so uh, don't, yeah. Don't forget that. Make yeah. sure you enable that, especially if it's gonna be your live server. Um, if we've opened up the console, it's going to take you through the usual Ubuntu installation. You can see it's obviously going to take you a lot longer than it was with our container. Um, and that's just the trade-off of using a virtual machine. And uh, go through the installer, follow it through all the way. Again, we can set our specific IP address if you wanted to, which we recommend. So in a virtual machine for Ubuntu, it looks something like this. Yeah, the wizard, even in the terminal for Ubuntu, is really pretty straightforward as an install i mean it it's really just go through them and tab you know tab uh, space to select options and then enter for next or okay i mean basically it's really nothing complicated to do sometimes it looks a little bit daunting just because it's not the graphical user interface people are used to but very easy to navigate yeah absolutely and that's pretty much something that you could have some uh, set up something similar to this depending on your your subnet and whatever your IP is in your range But um, that's how it would look so you would put that subnet in Our address the gateway and if you wanted to any name servers. Otherwise, you can just leave it as is So let's just say we went with that we'll go ahead and click Save that'll pull through our IP address and we click done Done we don't have to change any of this unless you had a reason to done uh, do we want an LVM group? Usually you want that removed in this virtualized setup. So just remove that, uh, but leave the entire disk option selected. Then click on done. Done again. Continue. Put a bunch of information in here. We'll say test LXC. Mind you guys, I'm not going to be keeping this. So all this information I'm putting in is just placeholder. Put in what's relevant to you and make sure it's accurate and easy to find name server is important. So. Uh, don't make it too complicated on yourself. And same goes for the password. Obviously, please make sure that's really secure. Click on done. Uh, definitely would recommend you want the SSH server installed. And that allows us to get to yep. the terminal without having to go through the console in Proxmox. Click on done. 
Here's a Snap store. We don't want to install like, anything from Snap. Yeah, just, yeah, just don't ig- install anything from the App Store. <laughs> just just ignore <laughs> Snap completely and click on Done. And uh, there you go. We basically have a virtual machine now installing and setting itself up. Once it's finished, if you have an SSH client that you like to use, you know, use that to access it. Otherwise, you can always use the console in Proxmox, which is really handy, especially if something goes wrong with SSH. You can still get to the server, um, basically with a KVM screen uh, up and running for you. I think that was a good overview. I mean, really, you know, we, we went through it pretty fast, but I think if they if they take their time, they go through and, and kind of pause the video as we're going to, to do the same things that you've done and, and really what we've talked about, they're going to have a good starting setup for what they're going to want to use for, for getting a business going. Now we're, we're using Proxmox. I think Proxmox is an incredible tool. I think the power that it has, it, it's a mature product. So I think this was a smart decision on our part. And, and if I was starting a business and I said, I want to use an open source virtualization system, this is, this is definitely the one I would use. There are some other ones out there, like you said, and if they have a preference for one of those, that's great. As long as they know how to navigate in it and do the similar things that we're going to be doing, I say pick the tool that makes you happy and then pick the tool that works best for you. But definitely, if you want to follow along step by step, uh, go out there, get the Proxmox ISO. We'll have links in the descriptions and the show notes um, so you can go do that and then, you know, burn it to a USB or, or set it up as a, you know, in a true NAS system as a virtual machine or, or, you know, kind of however you want to run that thing. That's great. But um, definitely get it installed. Follow the steps that we've done to get yourself a LXC container set up. Follow the steps that we've done to get yourself a, a Ubuntu VM set up and, and we'll kind of go. So like I said, next week we'll, we'll cover networking. Um, the cool thing about Proxmox is if you have a even a single NIC card, you can actually set it up to do some networking with like OpenSense or PSSense. But if you have a multi-NIC card in your system, uh, the one that I've got, has got four ports uh, and both, both of my servers have that. So you can set up some of those other open NIC ports. Uh, to be used with like your open sensor, your Proxmox, which is really great. You can set them up for VLAN stuff and things like that too. So um, a lot of power there. So depending on what they have, they may want to go ahead and uh, kind of plan to set that up. But Definitely. There's so many options. And I think if we are, our pace is good, we might be able to get you guys involved with starting off with Docker as well. So yeah, guys, if you also did want to look at supporting Proxmox and what they're doing, if you did have any interest in the enterprise repository like we were talking about earlier, Here's the pricing of what they offer. And like I said, look, it's pretty steep, to be honest, 95 euros a year, and it's per CPU socket. So that means, you know, if you've got a server with multiple sockets, that's going to cost you twice as much. If you're just starting off, it's really not essential that you do this. It's not going to give you anything crazy that you might need. And um, yeah, I I would say wait a little bit if you're happy with it down the track. Like we we waited three years before we decided to, to go for the enterprise. And we are literally running three servers in the cloud, so it makes sense for us. But in your scenario, that may not be the case. But you have the option there at all times if you wanted to go for it. And it also helps them out as well, so it's good all around, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. I'm I'm glad we're covering the the, the, the pricing of it because... If we're building a business and we say we do want to go with the enterprise, then, you know, estimating cost, you know, out the, you know, out the door before you start making money is pretty important. So knowing that you can go and get this installed and use it without any cost initially and getting things set up and making sure that it's going to fit your needs and what you want and what we want to do is one of the best things about open source software. But then knowing that I can go and start supporting their business to keep them in business and make sure that I continue to get those updates and those features that, that make this such a useful system, I think is, is the most important thing. So definitely knowing that just because it's, it's free, doesn't, doesn't make it bad. Um, I think it's super important to understand that you can also support it to help make it better over time too. Absolutely. Yeah. It's self-serving really at the end of the day by helping them, we're helping ourselves and we're helping the community in general. So Definitely get behind them, guys, if you have the money and you want to support them, by all means, please do. I think from our perspective for showing you what we've shown you today, I would say you don't need it right off the bat. But please, if you can, you know, help support them and, and support us as well. Um, so I think we'll leave, we'll leave it at that, Brian. What do you reckon? We'll pick this back up next week and, and we'll continue with the next part in the series. Yeah, I'm super excited. Super excited. Awesome. Well, thanks very much for your time today, guys. Really appreciate you coming to watch. Please remember to like and subscribe to our channels. Both Brian and I have been uploading these on both our channels as we go along with the series. And so it would really, really help us if you like it on both channels, if you do like the video. We would really appreciate it. If you like the video, like, subscribe, tell your friends about it so they can come along on the open source journey with us. And we'll talk to you next time. 
Thanks guys. Can't wait to see you in the next Ipricorp and awesome open source video.